everyone, my name is Von Leong. Please call me Von. It's actually short for Veronica. If we are expecting full house today, so it's great that you've all made it on time as we will send the latecomers the post-event recording. I am one of the three co-founders at Purpose Venture Capital. The other two co-founders are Sharon Seen and Sataj Yotikin. Purpose Venture Capital is an early stage investment firm. We support entrepreneurs to build sustainable and profitable tech businesses that will advance the UN Sustainable Development Goals through Purpose Aligned Capital. If you'd like to learn more about us, please do follow us at our LinkedIn page. Now, let's get into the webinar in proper. Welcome to Purpose Venture Capital's Leaders of Purpose discussion series. I'm Vaughn and I will be your host for this evening. This is where we invite investors, entrepreneurs and thought leaders to address the global challenges we face, including poverty, inequality, food security, climate change and environmental degradation. As a member of the startup and innovation ecosystem, we like to play a small part in developing sustainable solutions to the world's biggest problems. Today, we will be discussing on family offices investing for a better future. We are so thrilled to have three leaders of purpose from family offices and in the business family sector, sharing their top leadership, insights and perspectives on future trends investing, sustainability for future generations, and why family offices are investing in early stage tech companies. Without further ado, I shall now welcome our moderator for today's webinar, Family Offices Investing for a Better Future, and he will introduce our leaders of purpose, our prominent speakers. Sir Taj, please. Well, um, good afternoon to everyone um, and good morning to those connecting from Europe. Uh, I don't know how many there are, but I guess there will be people connecting from all over the world. Um, well, thank you very much for uh, being with us, uh, Professor Annie Cole, Walter Meekens, and, and uh, Serena Wong. And, and today, I think we do uh, have a really amazing lineup um, and it's a great start to uh, our, you know, um, second series. Uh, we've already done one Leaders of Purpose uh, discussion and today our focus is on family offices. Before I you, jump into, you know, moderating the panel, I think I'm going to leave uh, our panelists a few minutes to introduce themselves, talk about you know, who they are um, and how they are linked to the family office topic and over the years, you know, what they've seen as uh, fundamental differences and fundamental improvements in the way family offices are organized. So let's start with Professor Annie Cole. Um, mm -hmm. And um, hello, Annie. Yes. Hello. Hi, Sataj. Good afternoon, good evening, and good morning. Um, I hope you're not going to always start with me. Fine. No. And uh, a great pleasure to be here. Yeah, a great <laughs> pleasure to be here. And uh, I, I like that question, when do we start getting interested in family offices? Actually, uh, it all came about because about eight years ago, uh, we set up the Business Families Institute within SMU. And the reason is very simple. Uh, bulk of Asia, I think about 80% of Asia, are actually dominated by family businesses. But we didn't want to call it Family Business Institute because it would then be called FBI and nobody will come to us for thought leadership. All right. So Vaughn keeps saying thought leadership. Uh, but we call it Business Families Institute because the now is on the word family. And many businesses do get transformed. Businesses come and go 
people, but we like to believe that a family would stay together through hard times, good times, and as the business transform. And we are actually uh, very encouraged because eight years ago, uh, many of the family officers that are actually part of our membership came from uh, very much more older generation countries. So countries in Europe, countries in uh, India, you know, and North America, and they are actually multi-generations. They could have a liquidity event and then they put their wealth in a family office platform and they chose Singapore. But in the last three years, uh, we are starting to see that many of the family businesses um, do a liquidity event but may have also concurrent operating businesses and their next generation have actually taken on the role of managing the family well and the family office. So you might actually see parallel tracks where they actually have both a operating business as well as a family office structure to help them manage the wealth and manage the intergenerational transfer of wealth. So I believe this is a growing area and uh, we have now uh, many examples of even uh, family offices where the operating business is from our region and they are very much interested in setting up a family office. And I'm sure that conversation will come up uh, through the questions that Satat will then be fielding. So thank you very much for having me. I'm not an expert. I'm still learning and I'm taking a great pleasure uh, in coming across so many different family office models. So every family is a unique story and every family office has a unique history and pathway as well. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, well, how about you, Serena? What brought you here? How did you come here through the, your own professional journey and, and how, in what ways are you related to the family office topic? Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. So thanks for touch um, and hi everyone. Thanks for having me on the panel. And I think, you know, really happy to see Purpose Venture get off to a strong start. Um, and it's been, you know, it's really active in helping um, us in the investment community find a voice within the sustainable space as well as the family office management space. So thank you for that. I think really heartening to see how vibrant the community is becoming. So a bit on myself, um, I'm Serena Wong. I'm the head of plan advisory at Comet Capital. We are a full service professional multifamily office um, for, um, for now a curated group of first generation founders um, from Asia. Uh, my journey to the FO space or family office space was not linear. Um, no one, no, no one at least I know of say, you know, hey, when I grow up, I want to work in a family office. So mm. but what's worked well for me, at least, you know, in terms of navigating into the family office space is really always gravitating towards people that um, I find super interesting. Um, you know, people that I can learn from and, and people that I'm really, so, and families I'm very happy to sort of work alongside and with. So um, more personally, I'm born and bred Singaporean. I graduated from the National University of Singapore here. And my first job was at the um, Sovereign, Wealth Fund, Sovereign Wealth Fund here. So at a young age, it's really, you know, like, so quite proud to be sort of guarding the reserves of Singapore, now guarding the reserves of families. So over time, um, I worked in investment banking and uh, wealth management and also, you know, had, had the good, good fortune of being exposed um, globally, um, London, Paris, of New York, um, Singapore, and Singapore is always home. So directly back to your question on family office and, you know, what, um, what's sort of really hyper interesting and, and, and the changes that, that you know, I've, that I've sort of seen personally in this space in particular past few years is that I think family offices are getting and, and teams are getting and families themselves are getting a lot more sophisticated, um, but it is a very non-homogeneous space. So if you've seen one family office, you've only seen one family office. Um, but the running of a family office is actually quite a complex operation. So the team that you put together, you know, it needs to be a team with varied experiences mm -hmm. to really meet the varied needs and, and, and complexities of families with wealth. So that's kind of, you know, the, the keys of changes. And, and what are some, and so directly then, you know, what's some of the changes um, that's taking place right now? I think, you know, the, the rise of the family offices, uh, the new negotiating power, and like I mentioned, the increased sophistication. And I think, you know, going away from not just looking at financial returns, hence purpose, but also, you know, for focus on what's important to families. And, and this can be, you know, a whole long list. 
And I think, you know, more than directly is, um, you know, the, the also inclusion of private investments in addition to exposure to public markets. That's definitely, you know, at least for Asian families more and more um, so the case. And then um, I think the last point I'll make is that, you know, how I think the reliance or the development of some non-traditional um, financial um, channels, um, you know, it's, it's, it's definitely on the rise. Um, and I think, you know, how these financial institutions interact and, and help um, families will evolve um, along this journey. I, I'll take a pause there. No, no, that's, that's perfect. Thank you so much. I think there's, there's a wealth of information we will unpack as we go along the discussion. Um, well, now I'll leave the word to Walter, um, and I would like him to actually pronounce his own name because you know, <laughs> names have this particular uh, guttural sound. So. Yes, yes. So, so thanks, uh, Sir Tash, and a pleasure to be on the, on the panel. Uh, my parents indeed blessed me with a truly non-international name. So it is actually <laughs> Walter and then last name Kneipkens. So both of them are horrible in an international <laughs> setting. At some point in time, early in my career, when I was working in London as an investment banker, I actually thought about going by my second name, which is actually Peter, which is obviously a lot better, mm. but I never uh, identified as a Peter. So that's why I just stuck with the, with the, uh, the, the terrible first name. Um, <laughs> but actually, and, and uh, I guess I, I started a bit with my introduction then already saying that I started in investment banking, but I would say that I'm, I'm a prime example of what, uh, what the prof uh, co actually uh, uh, mentioned. So and that will come to light when I, when I finish the rest of my intro, I guess. So after investment banking, I spent some time at an activist hedge fund out in Europe, uh, then spent time at a private equity firm, uh, did an uh, INSEAD MBA, which was my first exposure to Singapore. And during my MBA, I decided that I wanted to be a startup founder. So I spent four years as a, as a tech founder. Um, and then since 2011, I've had to uh, step up for my family. So mm -hmm. I've since then represented my family uh, as our shareholders representative in the family company. Uh, so non-executive, but also, uh, I guess, technically somewhere in the uh, larger uh, Christmas tree, I have an, uh, an executive role as well. Mm -hmm. And next to that, so next to the operating company, I also got the responsibility of professionalizing uh, or running and then professionalizing our, our family office that had been around since the 80s. Uh, so at that point, it was still a completely Dutch uh, family office. And uh, like um, Professor Annie uh, explained, it was operating business plus family office. Um, uh, and then more recently, so around three years back, so I moved to Singapore six years back, but three years back, started to move the family office into Singapore. So I would now say that we are a Singapore-based family office with, I guess, European roots. Mm. Um, and the newest development is that we've, started to make the change from a pure single family office, which we were until slightly more than a year back uh, and transformed ourselves into a, uh, what we call a single family office for multiple families. Um, so we, we increased our team. Uh, we have a CMS license here in Singapore. Uh, and actually like uh, Serena mentioned, uh, we uh, have made that jump into uh, illiquids and alternatives. So I would say that private equity, for instance, is one of our key focuses uh, ourselves. So I guess the, the story ties in uh, a bit with the stories of, of both the ladies, uh, I guess. Well, I, I mean, actually, I'm, I'm tr truly impressed because we do have the three facets of the family office value chain here. You know, we have Annie who studies family business. <laughs> Study, you know, you study in the sense, in the sense that you are, you are a professor. Okay, so I study, you, fine. <laughs> yes. And then Serena is, is, is the one who actually, you know, helps them, advises them on a sort of, you know, investment and operational basis. And then Walter, he runs a family office. He is the family office, you know, if, if, if I may. I mean, I may be stretching it a little bit, maybe the, the terms, but I think this is this is an incredible mix um, in terms of you know looking at it from different perspectives. Now, the family office actually was around, has been around for a long time. I mean, if you look at the Renaissance period, even with the Florentine, you know, merchants in Italy to you know the, the British estates, and then. Um, 
all the way up to the 19th century, you know, big industrial families and then uh, a lot of wealth accumulated after World War II, you know, you, they, they've been around, but right, but there's always a sort of an aura of mystery around family office business, you know, what is this really, you know, what does it entail? Um, and now Singapore has become sort of the center of attraction for family offices. People have flocked in over the last couple of years. And I think Otto, you, you, you are a uh, 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 testament to it. So um, what, 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 why is Singapore such a center? What does it mean for Singapore? both on the investor side, on the investee side, from your own experience, how, how do you see this movement into Singapore and around Singapore, Singapore as a hub, uh, where will it take us? So Serena, if you'd like to jump in, I'll start with you, so I'll change the yeah, order. Sure. Um, and you know, they teach in business school, you always be the first to go so that no one's, no, 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 no one, no one takes the idea first. <laughs> I'm joking. Um, I think, you know, the, the attractiveness of Singapore as a family office or family business hub is very well documented. I mean, I think it's, it's, whether it's, you know, reputationally, um, you know, that's, that's very sound, um, the rule of law, the supportive government, um, and financial policies, you know, receive, you know, including the, the attractive uh, tax incentive programs that are very supportive for, for these endeavors. But I think what I will touch on, um, and, and that's less sort of documented um, in, in public media, is really on the qualitative side of things. And this mm -hmm. is, you know, really first-hand stories that we hear from families that, you know, we work with and, and those that, you know, we interact with. And I think, you know, that's around sort of the safety aspects of Singapore. So don't underestimate, like, you know, how good they feel when families come here and they can freely take a grab or taxi or go to a food court, you know, or enjoy the clean air, greenery. So these are, you know, they, when, when they tell this to me, I'm like, what, really? Um, but it really is what's valuable to them because then, you know, it's the ease of them settling in. It's the ease of relocating families and businesses and teams and people that they feel responsible for. So, you know, that's on the qualitative, um, qual um, you know, aspect, what, what they really value. Um, I think, you know, taking that one step forward, then, you know, we've, I think, done sort of that first preliminary couple of steps to attract um, families like, you know, Voucher here. Um, then the, the question is, what, how do we harness this collective experience and, you know, financial know-how and muscle that's accumulating here in Singapore? I mean, I, I know that, um, you know, within the sort of governmental agencies and all that, a key question that's always being asked is, what is the value of, you know, the contribution that these families can bring um, with their businesses? And, and I think, you know, that's something that will get refined over time. And, but suffice to say that to the extent that the value, you know, we can increase um, this value, Singapore will become more and more attractive absolutely on our own terms and also relative um, to the, the centers in the region. And particularly, I think, you know, in the investment world, the world order is now that, you know, we see two key ecosystems, this US is China, and Singapore is a unique venue to access um, these global opportunities. So that's my plug. <laughs> no, and, and that's the reality of what we've sort of been hearing. And just very quickly, you know, on, you know, um, the investment community and investee companies, I think, you know, for investment community, and I speak only, you know, for the family office community that I interact with, I think, you know, the interest to set up, um, you know, shop here and have some presence here is, is very strong. I think the momentum to hiring teams and talent here is definitely growing. I think you know, the challenge, because, you know, we don't only look at the positive, the challenge is that, you know, one, this talent pool, two, I think the language ability and the cultural affinity to service a lot of these families that come here, I think that's still very nascent stage. And also, you know, just keeping up to the pace of work and swift decision making that these families have, who are very comfortable operating, you know, in a very dynamic in, uh, environment with imperfect information. That's something that we are less comfortable with. So I think that's, um, you know, sort of my, my perspective on it. Thank you. Thank you, Serena. Um, anybody would like to jump in? Annie? Okay. Yeah, well, uh, um, maybe I'll jump in because I agree with uh, quite a lot of uh, Serena's points, but I would, I would add one rather important factor, and I guess that's just the, the Asian angle. Uh, so from a Western perspective, uh, people term this the, the century of Asia. Uh, I think from a uh, more holistic view, 
uh, people should probably say that we are back reverting to the mean and that we had uh, an anomaly which was uh, probably two or three centuries with uh, a western focus and now we're, we're going back to where it has been for millennia before that um, and and that has a has a big attraction to folks so uh, quite a lot of people want exposure to asia are underexposed to asia and then thinking about how do you get exposure to to a location is is obviously easier if you are based there or have a team based there or have a friendly um, relationship with a with a team based there. Um, I, I'm not sure whether we are allowed to go there in this uh, this conversation, but in the past there were always two options. Uh, mm-hmm. I think one of the options uh, eliminated itself or had a bit of help in eliminating itself as an option, uh, which now leaves one option. Uh, so so that that is rather rather key. And and why is Singapore uh, the one remaining option? Uh, and that, I think, comes back to quite a lot of the, the points that Serena made. Stability, safety, uh, good, uh, good legal frameworks. I think that the uh, VCC that uh, MES has uh, created uh, with the uh, legal community here is a key point. So it is, uh, I think we probably talk about it in every meeting that we have with either Asian families that, that would uh, uh, look to our help to moving into Singapore or European families looking to establish themselves in Singapore. VCC is, is one of the topics, uh, one of the reasons that we needed to get uh, licensed ourselves to get uh, access to the VCC. Um, so I, I think it's, uh, it's one of the, the key tools that uh, Serena and me will have in our, our toolkit uh, in helping families. Uh, then maybe, maybe to your point, and, uh, or, or uh, to, to add something a, a bit uh, interesting is uh, on, on what are the risks or where is Singapore still lacking? And I think one of the, the key issues there is, uh, is talent, which is also something that, that now we're starting to hear. So uh, we have now been approached by uh, headhunter firms that uh, uh, simply <laughs> cannot source the, the talent to staff new uh, sing, single family offices to then see whether they could uh, help their leads in another way by having them talk to us instead. Um, just today, I spoke to somebody that also... Uh, says that that just talent is is hard to uh, to get by so the the pool with uh, people with with the broad experience uh, that one needs as prof annie said uh, uh, when thinking about the family office and also serena made the point um the the, the pool isn't that large so um that that i i guess is one of the 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 key issues if singapore wants to continue growing the uh, family office uh, ecosystem. And I think MAS actually and SMU, for instance, are on the ball, uh, but maybe let me there pass my ball then over to to, uh, uh, the (laughs) professor because she might have something to say on that, I guess. Thank you very much, Walter and Serena. Um, Hear you loud and clear. And I think that's exactly where we are heading in terms of uh, the family office advisory program. And, you know, there are many people with um, the right competencies and the requisite skill. And if you look at Serena as well as Walter, they all came from an investment banking background or, you know, knowing about wealth management. And they are now growing the softer side as they interact with the families. But Walter is easier because he comes from a family business background. So there will be a lot of these programs. And uh, yes, at BFI, at SMU, we have already been doing this. And we have accredited programs to do this. Uh, I liked it that Serena actually mentioned the soft side. Recently, um, one of the uh, families that have set up in Singapore in the last three years came from America. And I had lunch with him two weeks ago. And he used the term home office. I actually like that word a lot. Not that family office doesn't sound right, but he actually used the word home office. And if you translate into Chinese, it's jia, jia tu bang gong shi. So home is where you feel secure and safe. And Serena and Walter talked about that. Not only is it just about your security and safety, it's about your children and your children's children. So when they moved over their wells and set it up here, um, Merle and Miriam Hinrich, all right, actually said the daughter, Annette, the son-in-law, and their grandchildren are all here. So I think the soft side matters tremendously. And, uh, and for him, 
setting out in Asia is because he has a link to Singapore 25 years ago in his trading activities. So Walter, I did not even ask you whether you had studied here because I assumed you had a link to Singapore because you have studied in INSEAD in Singapore. So a lot of times it's like coming back to Asia, but the safe harbour for them to get to know Asia is Singapore. So there are a lot of pull factors. There are also push factors. So I think the last year, the pandemic and the uncertainty in many countries and having Singapore at least try very hard to do it right and keeping the COVID numbers down and knowing that you have a family that it's going to be safe and you have schooling and healthcare and traffic and roads where women can walk late in the night and feel safe. So I think don't poo-poo the security and the safety, but the community, oh, the community is so exciting. <laughs> um, I think we are not only just having a community of investors, uh, so that we also need a community where the FO professionals can come together because there is so much that they could share learning from each other. And I really feel that the stronger we build up the ecosystem, uh, the stronger will be Singapore's place in terms of being able to help our family office, both the investor side as well as the investee side. And this is wonderful. Actually, I, I think just the, 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 the community that, that you talk about it actually sort of ties us in with the next question, which is around purpose. Um, um, your family offices or home offices, you know, in the United States, you're right, it's used interchangeably sometimes. You call home office, family office, and I think both of them have the sort of similar connotations. Um, they are evolving into full fledged. Um, financial, almost um, holding structures, whatever you, you want to call it, whether it could be VCC, whether it has a license to operate as an intermediary, but they, that family office or home office, which used to be the, the sort of the nice, cozy um, family asset uh, preserving institution is actually evolving into a uh, almost an endowment uh, um, uh, valuation, revaluation, and constant, um, you know, it has to be very much um, linked to the times and, uh, and the feeling and the spirit of the times. And, and what I've seen is that over the last uh, few years, especially with intergenerational change, a lot of family officers are defining their purpose. And the purpose is, you know, what sort of led us to actually call our venture also purpose venture capital is that, um, that, that intrinsically there has to be a reason why you're operating under that banner. There has to be a, beyond a strategy, a purpose of essence and being. Now, how do you define that purpose? How do your clients, uh, Serena, the, the, the you working with, Walter, you work with your family, and he sees the whole world from, you know, different perspectives. How do these families define purpose? Uh, it could be an anecdote, it could be your own experience, Any anything mm. that you'd like to share? You're asking Serena first. Oh, well, I, what, anybody what, would what, like what, to jump in? Yeah. Serena. <laughs> I think we should start with Walter because he actually Okay, we'll start with him. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sure, sure. I, I, I can talk a, a little bit about it um, because in, uh, I, I am uh, in the, the current family structure, I would say I'm, I'm third gen, so next gen, but I guess I'm also the, the current gen because I'm also currently the, the family patriarch, so it's a bit of an interesting combination there. Um, mm. But yes, we, we've definitely, and I, th I think that that constantly has to happen within the family. You constantly uh, reevaluate uh, what, what is the family and what is the family office and why is it together? What, what keeps us together? Is there a benefit in, in keeping everything together? Uh, I think there's uh, very rational grounds for keeping family wealth together. I mean, uh, bigger, bigger wealth, so a larger sum uh, that one can jointly invest uh, leads to better opportunities, uh, typically better fee levels that one could negotiate. 
Uh, so it, it is just a rational thing. So that, that is the cold side, I guess, of uh, why one uh, could or should potentially stick together. I think mm. somewhat um, uh, warmer is that uh, at times some families, and I, I'm, I'm blessed that, that our family came to that uh, conclusion, um, we, we came to uh, a, at least a current uh, joint uh, purpose, uh, which is um, that uh, we feel we have enough. Uh, so that, that, that might be a bit of an interesting concept, but essentially mm. what we are saying is the current generation is pretty happy with where we are. And if we can provide uh, for the next generation to be in the same shoes as where we are, then as the current generation, as guardians of the family wealth, we've done what we need to do. So it doesn't need to be more than what we currently have. Obviously, it needs to be inflation adjusted. Inflation is a big thing over a 30, 35 year period. Uh, but if the next gen is as well off as the current gen is, then it's all, it's all fine. Uh, so that has meant that we have uh, agreed as a family to uh, donate 100% of all our excess returns. So I simply have a, a very clear goal. I mean, there's an annual goal of where we need to uh, get to, uh, to, uh, to get to the asset level uh, to make the next generation as well off as the current generation is in 30 to 35 years from now. And literally every dollar above that uh, number uh, we donate. Uh, so that means that for me and for the team that uh, we work with here in Singapore, it's quite motivational because we know that we are not uh, working to enrich me or my family uh, mm. who have enough. We are essentially working to be able to donate more to charity. So yeah, that, that, that's where we get uh, our purpose. And then within the charitable field, uh, we are supporters of uh, effective altruism. So we try and make every dollar count a uh, thousand times over or something. Uh, so we hope that uh, over, over at least this period, uh, this generation's time uh, will make a, a lasting difference. Mm. So the, the multi-family offices that engage you because you're a single family office for multiple families. Sorry, is that... No, no, go ahead. <laughs> this is one this is exactly what I needed. I, the moderator should not even exist. Thank you. <laughs> Do you require them to also donate back once they make the mark? Uh, well, so we, we uh, and actually, we, we have all the uh, in house investment capabilities. So we don't uh, depend on other family offices um, mm. uh, nor banks. So we have the in house capabilities. Um, and that is actually one of the things that we also offer to, to other families. So, mm. I mean, we're, we're somewhere in the middle between a true MFO and an SFO, um, I guess, at this, this point in time. Mm. Um, I, I mean, we, we, we don't require anything of, of other people. Uh, I don't require anything of my team either. So uh, I am in the fortunate position that I have a lot of wealth. So... Uh, I personally uh, give away 10% of uh, all uh, my returns uh, from successful investments that I make myself. Uh, so mm. that's on top of the commitment of, uh, of the family. Uh, and as of uh, next month, because of a very successful investment that I made in 2012, uh, mm. I will be my, uh, the, the largest um, family uh, donor in the, in the family foundation. So um, yeah, yeah. Uh, that, that, but that's what, what I commit to doing and, and I won't enforce it on others. I mean, I'm a vegetarian myself, but I happily had lunch with people that had uh, non-vegetarian dim sum today. Um, <laughs> work work yes. for me. Uh, I mean, I think it's, it's better if we, if we try and uh, have everybody do what they're um, comfortable with themselves and then, then maybe what I do makes people think and maybe over time they might move my way which would be nice uh, or maybe they they need longer periods of time or they might never go my way and they have a different view which which should be uh, a way forward as well yeah maybe i'll offer a, a different or not different uh, um a, a parallel view 
Um, I think, you know, um, Walter speaks so very eloquently about um, his family and it's multi-generational. I mentioned, I think in my introduction that here at Comet, we work with first generation founders because in the Asian environment, I think it's still, um, most of the wealth um, still is sitting in G1, you know, first generation hands, right? And you know, the reason being for the family office coming together usually is born of a family need, uh, solving, solving an issue, right? Call it whether multi whether it's a, it's a transfer or whether you know there is now happily a liquidity event and and a professional team or assistance is is, is needed to step in um, to bring this further along. So I think mm -hmm. purpose for 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 us and then for the families that we work with actually develops is developing um, organically and over time. Um, so given that you know a little bit to about her sort of, you know, um, identity crisis in the sense that we're also like a multi-single family office kind of set up because each family is unique. They have their own purpose and objectives. And we are the glue, you know, we are the team that kind of brings it together. So naturally the purpose, I think, for Comet and the families we work with are a reflection of our common values. And in the sort of ongoing and organic development, um, I think of, of, of the uh, value system is that the purpose I think of why we work together is that we are on a long-term learning journey together. And specifically for the families, I mean, there are what comes across very clearly, even for these first-gen founders is that because they made their wealth, they're here to learn, they, they wanna stay relevant, you know, they're not one and done. Um, they mm. want to be of value to, to the community. And, and now that they have chosen to be in Singapore, they want to be of value to the Singapore community. And therefore, for Comet, we are this, um, this vehicle for them really, um, of, of we become the, the guardian or the reserve of this patient long-term capital that's looking for growth and looking you know, for what is that greater sort of use and purpose um, that's still developing. So that's mm. just you know, um, a parallel perspective. Mm. So the perspectives are actually part of the life cycle theory. <laughs> so, that, so you are actually hearing it. So you actually you will have families like Walters, and uh, they could be single family, they could be part of a multi-family office. Uh, for them, there is sustainable income stream because that is to ensure a certain standard and of living. But Walter used the word enough. So therefore, the power of families that are willing to power change. And I think you have a follow-up question about what you mean by sustainable investing. So there will be investments that they will look at that is going to make an impact and build change. There are going to be investments they are looking at that will allow for a sustainable stream of income so that it can continue to feed um, diverse members of the family. But when you feel that you've got enough, you are also giving back in philanthropy, social causes that are very endearing for you. So, you know, it's, it's like the purpose gets defined. The ultimate values will guide the purpose and you know your life cycles will change and drive that purpose as well and I think Walter you make a statement that you're first gen for the family office and third gen for the family business and that's exactly the kind of uh, event that we are seeing the future first gen do want to put their wealth into purposeful investing <laughs> So you are therefore seeing that kind of conversation. And when they come together, they want to make good returns so that they could actually go out there and build purpose and do purposeful uh, work for the community. So it's, it's actually tying together uh, purposeful investing and purpose for their family office. There could be a lot of these commonalities coming together. I think this was a really great way of putting it, Annie, because when I look at it from, um, you know, uh, the European family office perspective, um, sometimes there is a, a sort of um, a, a focus on sustainability for sustainability's sake, yeah. but sustainability not in put in perspective of, yes, you have to, you know, make sure that sustainable investments um, are actually a concrete way of enhancing the future of the family office. And that means that getting a you know, good financial return, if you're actually doing investments that make sense, is an ultimate goal. In, in Asia, I see sometimes a separation between yeah. the, 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 the sustainable investments and the sustainable um, 
um, sustainability themes, partly because um, sustainability themes seem to have a connotation as if the return is low and, and hence they belong to the philanthropic parts <laughs> of the activity, but not necessarily to the activity that is more remunerating much more, um, um, you know, with financial returns. So, so, it, but, but it's a, it's a dialogue, it's evolving. So mm. where, where does sustainability, I mean, I see that uh, it plays an important role both in the investment cycle and in the, the choice of the investment instruments. But do you, for example, Walter, do you think about sustainability to do other family offices who work with you feel strongly about sustainability? Do you forego return sometimes just because you want to be in the sustainability? So um, to, to answer that, I think it's uh, uh, in, in some shape or form extremely important. So we screen all our investments for it. Uh, in part of our uh, private equity due diligence, we do. And also in our investment committee notes that we make, uh, ESG and or impact is one of the topics. Mm. Um, to your very specific question towards the end, would we forego uh, financial return for uh, impact? The answer there now is a clear and resounding no. In the past, mm -hmm. the answer was yes. Mm. Uh, but I think we, we learned and we wisened up. Uh, I think that uh, if one uh, has uh, or there's a concession, financial concession, it's very unlikely that the impact one would make uh, compensates enough for the financial uh, concession that one makes. Uh, and actually getting the market rate return and then spending that same financial concession on very effective charity like effective altruism uh, probably mm -hmm. brings you more, more impact. On the other hand, so uh, to, to, to be as sharp as your question is, uh, we will forego specific investments mm. that we don't find sustainable. So uh, it is not yeah. that we would, in a specific investment, allow for a financial concession. But yes, there are investments where we go, this no, no. Doesn't, doesn't pass the, uh, the mark. Um, and at times that, uh, that can be very painful. I, I, I had a very difficult uh, time what is it uh, one and a half years back looking at a, a uk co-investment that we got offered uh, by a private equity fund that we had exposure to and the deal very clearly to me looked like a 6x type deal which for a buyout is uh, obviously rather solid given the low risk uh, but it uh, it required a lot of uh, time to get comfortable on the ethical side of things and actually mm. luckily and, and, and I guess it was because the fund manager also saw that it was at least a sensitive field. Uh, they actually prepared a whole deck on the topic and, and why there was no issue and why it was actually a positive. So they actually themselves saw it as an impact investment uh, where it was definitely on a borderline where in the wrong way of approaching that same topic, you could get into very unethical type uh, business, but uh, done in the right way, it could actually get pretty close to uh, to impact. So this was in the medical field, which which might make it clear why it mm. it, it is quite uh, quite sensitive and, and gray. And it actually led me to, to having a discussion with my uh, my wife on it, who otherwise is never in, uh, interested in in the investments. But I just wanted to 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 clear this with her with, because i mean i'm I, i'm a rational and financial guy right so i see a 6x investment and i go Whew, that is interesting right but uh i just wanted to uh, to to make absolutely sure uh that this was right and that i would be able to look in in the mirror and and defend that uh investment also to my family members right so what what if uh, something bad happens and a family member would then challenge me and go why did we make that investment? Are you just uh, just greedy? Why 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 did you do it? And then I need to uh, always be able to uh, to stand up and and explain them that uh, we looked at it. Uh, these were the factors we considered, and we thought it it passed all the ethical uh, hurdles that were there, uh, and that it actually could have a a positive impact instead of a negative one. And sure, I mean you can always be wrong, right? So 
Mm. Uh, was I 95% sure that it would be uh, solid? Maybe it was 90% certainty, right? But you will never get to 100% certainty that, that something is uh, on board on, on every ground, uh, I fear. Excellent. Thank you. Serena, how about yourself from your experience with your clients? And yeah, sure. I'll, I'll offer a few points. And I think, you know, um, I just wholeheartedly concur uh, with, with what Valta said, um, you know, on, on it's, it's easy, you know, I think that the theme in terms of theme, you know, and trend, um, sustainability, ESG, you know, it's a mega trend. Um, but, you know, it is in its infancy in Asia. Um, from what I've read, I think, you know, 50% of um, assets uh, managed in, in Europe have some kind of um, ESG or sustainability lens. Um, I think in the US it's closer to about a third. And I think in Asia, you know, we're closer to sort of 1% um, of assets being managed um, by sort of sustainability strategies, uh, which sort of give us, you know, a, a long runway. Um, you know, we, we do have a gap uh, to close with the rest of the world in terms of sustainable investing. Um, but, you know, this, what is very sure, um, you know, I think on, on, on our end also is that this uh, momentum will intensify um, with, particularly with intergenerational wealth transfer, uh, because it, it is a way uh, absolutely for next gen to stamp their mark, to customize of how family wealth is discussed and managed. And particularly for, I think, younger and women investors, you know, they, we do tend to want to express um, sustainability as an investment priority. Um, but like I said, it's in, in its infancy and, and, and for us, long run way ahead, um, but we do have a choice and a voice and particularly in a forum like this, you know, for purpose uh, venture. Um, and it's, it's that voice that I think, you know, we, we are here to exercise, but cautiously over time, because at this point, I think, you know, just to, to, to you know, be on the rational side of things, there really is no de facto definition of what is sustainable uh, and what is a sustainable investment is, is what we want it to be, right? And even, you know, we look at sort of S&P, um, you know, index, ESG index with, I think, you know, currently maybe 300 plus firms, there is no sort of strict standards as to, you know, what are the metrics um, that, that sort of wraps uh, around this. So, I mean, what we can do is, you know, the very rudimentary things. So the negative and the positive screens, um, that was mentioned before. I mean, negatively, certainly no dirty, you know, no gambling, no, 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 no fights and all that. But also the positive screen, which is within the themes and sectors that we look at, you know, try to look for companies and, and names that are best in class that fits um, the theme. And, and that's sort of what we um, have taken as a very pragmatic approach. Um, when we do engage with managers, I think, you know, managers these days, um, are very forthcoming if they are a signatory to UNPRI. You know, they will tell you first um, because it has become, you know, sort of one of the check the box for, for many institutional, um, for most, in fact, if not all institutional investors in the market. Um, and, and then again, for us, you know, being sort of selective in the process and even more so uh, when we think through ESG, you know, it's, it's not just going with the hurt on a mentality. Um, the hurt mentality. I mean, I, I think, you know, for example, just to, for example, my, Microsoft, I think it's about 4% of, of, the, in, of the index, uh, ESG index. Um, we don't buy just because, you know, it's, it's part of that index. There has to be sort of really supportive reasons of what that fits the, the trends and the themes that, that, that we look at and also the future growth profile. Um, so the long and short of it is that very confident um, of the theme, um, still very cautiously learning from everybody, you know, on the panel and certainly, you know, from the industry, you know, how, how that, um, how to navigate it and how to pick the right names. Um, I think practically for us, if, you know, just to give a few examples, um, you know, we, we have sort of, uh, you know, I think one of the simple, simpler themes for us to execute on is that of inclusion, whether it's educational education, you know, via ad tech. So, you know, um, so really using technology that can give broad based access to not just sort of, you know, large cities, but also um, smaller, more rural areas. Um, where they can then have access to sort of, you know, after school uh, material and also, you know, so these star tutors and teachers. That's something that, you know, we've been, um, we've actively put to work. And, you know, within the health space, health tech, you know, it's definitely also very current and very topical at the moment. And I think, you know, we've been uh, executing on the theme for, for, for a long time. Um, not just, I think, you know, for the for-profit sector, but also, you know, with the thinking um, and, and learning process of how do we give access to as many, um, you know, uh, uh, patients and, 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 you know, those who need sort of, especially when they're in chronic disease situation. And the last thing I will speak on is around uh, sustainability. And one of the areas that we are looking at very intently, but have 
to be full disclosure, not executed on is in the renewable materials, biodegradable space, because it really takes, we're not scientists, right? So it really takes us, it, it takes time for us to, to understand, you know, not just the technology, the implication, um, also, the, you know, just to, to have a grasp that ecosystem so that we can present it in a way that's, co that's you know, kosher and, and logical to us and also the families we work with. Yep. Mm. Well, great. I, I think I, this, this, the, the, we need a whole section, a session on sustainability. Yeah. Those passionate uh, topic, topics, and and a lot of people are interested in. It. But let me go to actually a number of questions that came from the audience. And uh, since we have roughly about ten minutes before we close, we'll just um, pick some of the questions. Well, one um, is well, what. How has COVID environmental considerations, social pressures, you know, all of the geopolitical risks over the last year uh, influenced how family offices invest? Um, have you seen any type of um, a positive and negative um, repercussions from what we've faced over the last year? And, and, and it's not only COVID, and there's, there's so much happening, you know, a lot of tensions with the US and China and, and a lot going on in Asia and elsewhere. What, 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 what's one, one thing that, that actually um, you think was an outcome of this year, long year of turmoil? So I jump in here. Yeah, yeah, right. okay. mm -hmm. So I think essentially many of our family offices do have a flight to quality. So risk management plays a very strong role. Uh, many of the new family offices they have set up, like I said, chose a country where there is a security factor. Uh, when they look for talent, I have actually seen many of them not just looking for investment professional, they have actually looked for compliance and risk managers first. So they actually find that that risk consciousness is something that is very much in their radar. They are looking for talent that are going to help them set up the offices, they can manage the reputational risk, they can look at the uh, transfer of funds and you know clear, clear guidelines. So I think the risk awareness is a lot more heightened. Now, of course, it doesn't mean that they don't go after returns. So they are also very consciously looking for opportunities because in times of crisis, that's when you also have a whole plateau of opportunities. And I do see very active um, private equity investments coming up in the last year. So it looks like a barbell. They are actually very risk conscious, but at the same time, they do have an appetite to seek out opportunities. And I, I let Serena and Walter. No, that, 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 that's a great response. I mean, the, the, looking at risk and compliance as the first steps to get into the business is, 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 is truly interesting in terms of, you know, looking at their behavior. Serena, anything that you would like to add? I think, you know, with the, the direct answer to your question, you know, whether anything has fundamentally changed, I think, you know, the, the short answer is actually no, because the, the long-term orientation, you know, the, the sort of orienteering um, the lens and the portfolio and how we look at um, managing and navigating um, family wealth and market cycles is for the long-term. So given that, then, you know, the sectors that we look at, call it, you know, consumer tech, healthcare, these are large circular trends. So in fact, COVID would have probably likely a net positive effect to the investment because it really mm. brought forward and accelerated, you know, a lot of the adoption, the trends, um, you know, I, I think the, the recent study, I think by Google um, was that, you know, sort of five years of push forward, right, of, of these sort of adoption and trends. Um, but the short answer is that, you know, for the short term, you know, was there a need to be uh, nimble, dynamic, um, I wouldn't say opportunistic, but, you know, yes, looking at, you know, what are things that can be of value. Um, I think, you know, that's what any good bank mm. office or good um, asset manager um, or custodian of, of wealth would and should do. So, um, you know, that's, that's, uh, that's I think, the, the, the long version of the short answer. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. Well, how about uh, one question that actually it's sort of well, we, we, people keep on asking, but we don't actually elaborate on it, but there's always a stigma on it. It's about um, cryptocurrencies. Um, um, 
fa family offices, you know, so far, um, they, they have been pioneers in certain areas over the years. Um, they do look at certain investments. Um, and cryptocurrencies now is the big hype and everything. You know, there's a hype element to it, but there's also a, a, a well-wishing element to it, you know, whether they're going to take over the fiat currencies and all that. How, how do you see that in family offices? You know, uh, do you see any, any interest for this? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm fine jumping in there. So um, <laughs> my... Um, very successful investment that I uh, managed to, to exit from 2012 uh, happens to be a listing that is tied to uh, to crypto. Uh, so that, uh, that, that says something about what my thoughts are around cryptos, I guess, uh, within, uh, but, but maybe to bring it to more of well, a- were you, were you a pioneer in this? Were, did other family offices share the view that you had about to, that's uh, well, this, this was a, This was, at that point in time, a personal investment. So I just made okay. an angel investment, seed investment in Coinbase. Uh, and that was a year after I bought my first uh, Bitcoin. So I bought my first Bitcoins in 2011. Um, within the, the larger family office uh, structure, we've had a, an allocation to crypto since 2017 or so uh, mm -hmm. in, in every of the last four years, including this year, our uh, minute, uh, I think it was probably at uh, half a percent, maybe 1% exposure, probably close to half a percent most of the time. Uh, but that little half a percent exposure that we got, which we wouldn't have missed if it would have gone to zero, uh, resulted in a meaningful um, return on the overall full strategic asset allocation. Mm. Uh, in all those four years since 2017, uh, three of those years positive, one of those years negative. So the negative was 2018. Um, but in all the other years, uh, this, this little position had a very meaningful contribution uh, to the performance and actually led to, to rather significant outperformance. Uh, we have something, something crazy happening, uh, happening now where uh, within our hedge fund mandate, we have a bit of crypto exposure as well. And so that little crypto exposure there uh, now is um, around half of the full um, hedge fund mandate, which got returned over the last uh, two years or so. So uh, it, it is rather silly and it leads to crazy returns <laughs> like a 20% uh, monthly return in February for our full hedge fund uh, allocation. I'll, I'll offer, I'll offer a, a perspective from a professional team. Mm -hmm. um, and because oh, take care. <laughs> <Serena, because, laughs> no, 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 not that you're never, now you're saying that we're not a professional no, team. No, no, no. <laughs> but you know what I mean. So from professional manager, family office, you know, not, not my family's wealth, well, sir. <laughs> so um, I think, you know, um, to, to the point on, you know, it's a learning journey and helping families learn. As a family office, you know, we also made a call to, to get exposure. Certainly not as, you know, not as nimble and as early as Valter because, you know, when you put your own money PA, it's, it's I think that that hurdle, it's, it's potentially a little bit different. So I think, you know, what then made us have exposure and decide on exposure was really that there were very clear signals and clear trends, both from fundamental as well as, you know, trading perspective that really like being a responsible manager, we needed to do something about it. But then, but also, you know, from the, the team perspective is how do we help families have that exposure, but, you know, looking at sort of the risk factors around custody and all that, get the heads around that, right? So that's when the team comes in and say to families that, you know, we are going to get an exposure, but we're going to get directional exposure. So there are instruments in the market that will allow directional exposure without sort of the risk of actually owning and holding custody of these assets. And that's, mm. again, you know, how we, we are part of the integral learning journey with families and, you know, really putting it and, and, and putting, you know, our, our sort of um, advice very strongly and say that this is something that we need to do. Yeah. Thank you. This is this has been very insightful, and thank you so much. Uh, I think we've had a wonderful panel, and um, hope we get to see each other also in Singapore um, now that we're all here. So I'll leave it to Vaughn to close. Um, Vaughn, any last thoughts? 
Well, I'm very excited about this uh, discussion earlier. It's very insightful. I learned mm. one thing or two. Um, personally, I was a consultant with uh, for an Indonesian family on venture philanthropy and impact investment. So, um, and I must say, uh, I must be very thankful to Prof. Annie. I think you are doing a great job in starting this in terms of the, in the whole industry development. That Thank will you. Really get the whole sustainability conversation going. And Serena, you rightly point out we need a voice to close the 2.5 trillion financing gap each year until we achieve that. By I know we only have 10 more years to go, but mm. there's a lot more we could do. And the role of family offices is very critical. And I say what the I, I I don't know how you will reflect on your 2012 uh, investment, but I must say you are really ahead of your time. You're innovative and very refreshing to hear leadership, you know, from a family office coming from your side uh, to, to not just venture into this area, but really driving your family office ahead. So very exciting for me to hear this. So thank you so much for your insightful discussion. I'm quite sure the audience have learned a lot more than I do as well. Um, so just a few things to wrap up. Uh, we will have our next uh, webinar on tech investments and trends. And we will, as usual, invite an entrepreneur, a seasoned investor and industry uh, developer to, and thought leader to join us. So Mark, your diary is going to be on June 10th. 5 to 6 p.m. Singapore time. So thank you everybody uh, for your time today and have a good evening. Bye.